Great, hello everybody, um, and it's a welcome from me, Simon Walsh, to the fourth thrilling instalment of the SOFA series from 5 Essex Court. Now this has proved to be a rather useful tool to keep us, the 5 Essex Court Barrister team, in touch with you, and hopefully to keep you up to date with developments in the law whilst you're all stuck at home. My thanks go to my colleagues who are participating in the series, and of course to Georgina, our Head of Marketing, who has been key to setting them up, and perhaps more importantly, getting the technology to work. And don't forget that in addition to this broadcast, you can find all of the SOFA series on our dedicated YouTube channel as well. And today's presentation will be uploaded and available to view on YouTube from tomorrow. And then just one more plug, the next edition of the Five Essex Court Police Newsletter is being sent out today and tomorrow. If you're not on the mailing list for it, but would like a copy, just drop Georgina Connor an email in Chambers. Right, so down to business. Today, we're going to be talking about the new version of the Police Conduct Regulations, and it's the version that went live in February. The presentation will last for about 35 minutes and will be followed by answers to any questions you ask us as we go along. And you can do that via the message feature, which you'll find in the Zoom controls, probably at the bottom of your screen. Now, the best news for you is that I am not giving the presentation. That's being done by Bobby Talalay, and he's undoubtedly the best person for the job because he was instructed by the Home Office to help with the drafting of the 2020 regulations and the new Home Office guidance. So no one will know them better than he. All they're allowing me to do is to give you a very short introduction. And in this introduction, I'm going to make just one simple point. These new regulations do contain quite a bit of new detail but their fundamental aim and purpose is really unchanged. Police misconduct proceedings are not a punishment regime. They're there to do the three things highlighted by the College of Policing. First, to maintain public confidence in and the reputation of the police service. Second, to uphold high standards in policing. And third, to protect the public. And even after the 2020 regulations, they still do these three things, in the words of Bill Taylor, in a framework that is simple, minimal, and meets the needs of modern policing by avoiding an overly legalistic or adversarial environment. Remember, and please remind your LQCs, that these are not regulations just for conduct hearings. They apply equally to meetings, and they need to be equally accessible and comprehensible to an investigator and a sergeant dealing with a misbehaving constable as they do to an LQC dealing with a misbehaving chief inspector. Keep that at the forefront of your mind when using the regulations, and I don't think you'll go far wrong. But now, uh, can I please hand over to Bobby, who's going to put all the important meat on today's bones. Over to you, Bobby. Thanks, Simon. Um, welcome everyone to a glorious uh, Wednesday afternoon in, in London, uh, or at least where I am. Um, you'll be happy to know this is not a coronavirus themed webinar. Um, we're going to be talking, as Simon's indicated, uh, about changes to the police misconduct regime. Um, for the purposes of today, uh, we're going to assume that people listening in have at least a passing interest in the regime and have some understanding and familiarity uh, with the legislative framework as it was. Um, otherwise, I'm afraid this is going to be um, all Greek. Um, so first of all, what's happened? Um, well, uh, on the 1st of February, um, various things came into force. First of all, changes to Schedule 3 of the 2002 Police Reform Act. Secondly, new regulations were uh, uh, put into force for conduct, complaints and misconduct, performance and appeal tribunal rules. Um, and thirdly, there's a new uh, Home Office uh, guidance document. Um, I should declare, as, as Simon has, I have a vested interest, so if it's wonderful and it makes complete sense, I'll take all the credit, but if there are errors, um, then uh, that, that's probably someone else's fault and I can't, can't be held responsible for that. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on the conduct regulations and the guidance because we only have 
half an hour, 40 minutes, and, and there's not enough time to go into the minutiae of changes to the other regimes. Um, I should flag up at this stage that one of the things uh, we've done at 5S's course as part of a training package we've put together is create a schedule or a table outlining all of the differences uh, in the, um, uh, all of the major differences in the new regulations compared to the old ones. So if you're looking for where regulation 21 and the 2012 regulations is now, the table will show you it's regulation 30. If you'd like a copy of that table, can you email Georgina and she'll be happy to, to ping one over uh, to you. Um, so what are we gonna be looking at today? Four, four headlines really. Uh, the first is just a quick look at the, uh, the new powers and responsibilities for the IOPC. Secondly, and this is, this is the meat of it really, um, the changes to uh, the definitions for misconduct and gross misconduct and the new procedure called the reflective practice review process. Thirdly, changes in respect of whistleblowers and the standard of duties and responsibilities. Uh, and fourthly, uh, at the end, some of the changes to the hearings process um, uh, to try and make it a little bit um, more streamlined. So, first of all, the IOPC with great power comes great responsibility. Um, they've streamlined a little bit, so we had no longer have any managed or supervised investigations under Schedule 3. That, I think, is a blessing. Um, they were muddled. They didn't really, they, they fell between two stools. What that leaves uh, uh, investigations by the appropriate authority only, uh, directed investigations and investigations by the IOPC, which seems a sensible streamlining of responsibilities. This should, one would hope, encourage the IOPC to take charge in those investigations that merit it, either in terms of directed or in terms of its own uh, investigations. Perhaps more, well, much more significantly, the IOPC can now conduct hearings. And that's designed for three occasions. Uh, it's Regulation 24 of the new 2020 regs. First of all, where there's a disagreement between the appropriate authority and the IOPC for the bringing of or the form of a hearing, a disciplinary hearing. Secondly, where there's agreement between the two parties, the IOPC should conduct it. Uh, and thirdly, um, where the IOPC determines it's in the public interest, it should conduct proceedings. In other words, either when everyone thinks it's a good idea or when no one can agree, so the IOPC takes charge. So up until now, the IOPC hasn't really been involved with the business end of misconduct hearings. And that can often, at least in my experience, lead to a slight disconnect in, in, ex, in what people are expecting uh, and how things should be conducted. That hopefully will be um, now dealt with by the fact the IPC will, will manage a, an investigation right through to the end of a hearing or a meeting. It should make the process uh, more efficient. It should also mostly remove that unnecessary two-stage process which has existed to date, whereby you have a different um, investigative body uh, as compared to a different presenting body. So the IOPC will investigate and then the AA will present. And that has led, uh, in my experience, and I think the experience of a lot of people listening in, to real problems, particularly around uh, the provision of information from the IOPC investigative team to the appropriate authority for the purposes of determining what should be disclosed to the officer and to the hearing. That will hopefully disappear because there shouldn't, there shouldn't be much scope now for a different investigative body as compared to a different presenting body. But where that still does exist, the Home Office guidance has set out new guidance on that, and it's at paragraphs 9.19 to 9.26, which I recommend reading because it's actually it's, it's quite thorough. But essentially it's this. Uh, the IOPC uh, investigative officer is obliged to provide all material mentioned in the report and any documents they consider relevant. They must also provide a schedule of all retained material the appropriate authority can request it so it can fulfill its duties. And if there's any dispute between the two, the matter goes to the chair for the chair to determine. So there is now a process in place to deal with that. Unfortunately, uh, there was a last minute change to the wording of what is now regulation 30, what was regulation 21, um, as to um, what material needs to be provided to the officer. Whereas before the test was one simply of relevance, the test is now what might reasonably considered, be considered capable of undermining uh, or assisting uh, the case. Um, that isn't, um, not much more is said about that in the regs. The guidance uh, states in terms that the criminal test has not been imported into the misconduct regime, but expect applications um, from uh, officers, counsel, that, that it has been, or that the uh, spirit of it has been. And I would envisage that at least we'll see preliminary applications around disclosure as a result of that change. My personal view, 
nothing has really changed. The test is still effectively relevant. Right, <clears throat> misconduct, gross misconduct, and the reflective practice review process. Um, so there are new definitions for misconduct and gross misconduct in Regulation 2. Uh, misconduct now means a breach of the standards of professional behaviour that is so serious as to justify, justify disciplinary action. And gross misconduct means a breach of the standards of professional behaviour that is so serious as to justify dismissal. So the change effectively is in misconduct, there is now a seriousness threshold where previously that wasn't articulated in the regulations. So that leaves an obvious gap and begs two questions. First of all, what happens to breaches of the standards of professional behaviour that are not serious enough to justify dismissal, uh, sorry, justify disciplinary action? And secondly, what kind of matters fall into that category? There is a viewpoint, a viewpoint to which I subscribe, that says there's always been a seriousness threshold for misconduct matters. It certainly, it certainly exists in other disciplinary jurisdictions, either in the, the legal framework that governs them or where it doesn't specifically say so, the courts have interpreted that it does include a seriousness threshold, for example, in, in the Bar Standards Board cases. However, whatever the position was for officers, it's now explicit in the regulations. And to meet that gap, that gap between breaches of the standards of professional behaviour on the one hand and breaches that are serious enough to justify disciplinary action, there is a new process called the Reflective Practice Review Process. And I'm going to read now from paragraph 13.7 of the guidance, because this is where it sets out the purpose and the aim of that process. It says this, the purpose behind this reformed system is to develop an approach to the handling of matters which fall short of the expectations set out in the Code of Ethics and are considered low-level misconduct, mistakes or performance issues that can be handled in a more proportionate and constructive way without recourse to formal disciplinary proceedings or performance procedures. Um, as anyone who's dealt in this field will know, there is an infinite variety of ways that police officers can get up to um, low-level naughtiness right the way through to extreme uh, improper behaviour. Uh, given that, given, given that you really can't cater for what an officer is going to get up to uh, on his own time when he thinks no one's looking, there's little detailed guidance as to what kinds of activity might meet that seriousness threshold. Uh, and it's going to be, to a, to a great extent, a judgment call um, by those looking at uh, the case uh, on its facts. The guidance does imply at least that motive might play a part. It refers um, to mistakes, it refers to poor judgment, um, both of which suggest that um, the, the less intentional the, the misconduct was, the, the less it might be considered uh, so, uh, enough to meet the seriousness threshold. Um, but, but ultimately, there's a huge amount of discretion that's going to be afforded to uh, the appropriate authority and indeed to the chair when looking at uh, whether this process should be uh, utilised. Um, and uh, legal departments, chairs, appropriate authorities, professional standards need to be conscious um, that they exercise that discretion properly and within the um, framework of the purpose of uh, uh, police conduct proceedings. Let me give you an example. So I, I did a case uh, a while back where um, it came out of a traffic stop the um, people uh, in the car, it was a couple and their kid, uh, they were black, the officers were white. There was an allegation of, um, this all came from the dad who was driving. He was stopped because of uh, a dodgy traffic move. He alleged that the officer in question had been incredibly rude, had uh, taken his wallet out of his pocket without permission, had racially abused him. And there was a separate, completely separate allegation concerning um, um, uh, disobeying a lawful order in respect of taking over time. So obviously with the racial discrimination, this was a very serious matter until the couple split up about two months before the hearing and the wife got in touch with professional staff and said, it's all lies. I was there. He didn't say, this officer didn't say a word of the discriminatory stuff. He was a bit rude, but you know, nothing. That was because my husband was being an absolute uh, uh, pain. So obviously we drop at that point, the uh, racial discrimination allegation. All that's left then really is an unlawful search because what happened was the officer handcuffed and then asked permission to um, see the guy's wallet to see his driving license, which obviously he gave, and the allegation concerning uh, overtime. This went to a full hearing because the officer in question was on a uh, final written warning. And ultimately, um, uh, a small matter was found proven that he wasn't dismissed. That kind of situation, I think, is exactly the kind of thing that will fall square within this new reflective practice review process, where ultimately, Sure, the standards have been breached. 
um, but they are so low level and it's so minor that it is not proper to drag this officer through a formal misconduct proceeding. The proper approach and the much more proportionate approach is to use this new process to actually try and make sure they know their powers a little better, they don't get them wrong, as opposed to abuse them. Uh, and um, uh, everyone comes out of this with a job at the end of it and able to do their job that they, they've not really breached the standards of in any great way. So that's one side, which is trying to treat things proportionately at the low level. However, once you get into the misconduct regime, this, uh, this dovetails with a slightly greater uh, severity and outcome that's open to panels on uh, determining um, uh, outcome. So first of all, management advice is gone. That's now subsumed into the reflective practice review process. Uh, reduction of rank is back um, and uh, written warnings and final written warnings can last for longer uh, than uh, previously. They can now last for up to two years. So reduction of rank hasn't been around in a long time. Um, most practitioners either have never seen it or have long forgotten it. Um, the guidance has some quite detailed provisions about when it's suitable and when the circumstances would warrant it. It's not to be seen as a softer option where there's some sympathy for an officer that the panel just don't want to dismiss. The focus is on poor leadership, so really it's, 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 it's applicable, as the name suggests, to those of higher ranks. Um, uh, and um, particularly where the aggravating and mitigating factors result in the conduct falling between final written warning and dismissal. Um, it gets quite complicated where um, the officer is more senior than the sergeant or where there are multiple senior officers in question because the chair has the option to reduce by multiple ranks and has the option to reduce multiple officers ranks and that has to be exercised fairly obviously and with caution um, but the presumption is that once you're demoted you don't get promoted for another two years. So how does this reflective practice review process work then? So it's a really flexible system. It's not designed to be a, a prescriptive or a particularly formal process. Um, it can take place at any stage of the, uh, of the process, right from the beginning when the investigation is just starting and severity is being assessed, all the way to the determination at the end of a meeting or a hearing if the, um, if the senior officer or the chair of the panel uh, determine um, that it doesn't meet the threshold for misconduct. Um, and where they do decide that, they must consider the reflective practice review process. It's not, it's not an optional. Um, it's, it's something that the police, off, the police force at all times have to be considering. And that makes sense because the purpose is to improve at all stages the um, conduct of officers, even when it's very low level, nipping things in the bud before they become more serious. Um, so it should be conducted by a senior officer or line manager. And there are three stages. The first is fact finding, which is the name suggests the reviewer, um, assesses the facts that have been determined through the investigation and invites the officer to provide an account. Discussion, that should play, take place quite quickly and should be quite broad, um, consider wider relevant circumstances. And, and the report, so there has to be a report at the end of it. And there are all kinds of other outcomes. And there's not a prescriptive list, but there's recommendations in the guidance as to um, uh, uh, what might be suitable. See paragraph 13.63. You can have, for example, um, uh, restoration, training, shadowing, mentoring, mediation, referral to welfare services, interventions if drugs or alcohol are the problem, that kind of thing. Um, but it's not uh, an easy out for the officer. Um, they can always be referred back into the misconduct process if new information comes to light that takes it back above the seriousness threshold. Um, otherwise, what's said in, uh, in, in this process is not to be used against the officer for the purposes of, uh, of misconduct. But if the officer doesn't engage, the officer refuses to really get involved in the process, then they can be referred back to misconduct for that as well. So it's a brand new system. It's a system that I think makes good sense. Um, it's a system that, that, that seeks to ensure that the police force doesn't hound out those who make low level, simple mistakes, which can be better rectified through training or some other restoration mechanism than by the formal misconduct process. And hopefully will alleviate some of the um, the less severe matters that come across the desk of professional standards department. Right, topic three, uh, duties, responsibilities, and whistleblowers. So there's one change to the standards of professional behavior, which sit, I think, behind schedule two of the conduct regs. Uh, and uh, whereas before the standard of duties and responsibilities said 
Police officers are diligent in the exercise of their duties and responsibilities, which is nicely vague. Um, added to that now are the following words. Police officers have a responsibility to give appropriate cooperation during investigations, inquiries and formal proceedings, participating openly and professionally in line with the expectations of a police officer when identified as a witness. So what, why is that being included? Well, it's been included because there was a specific concern that was highlighted during consultation that police officers were not properly engaging with professional standards and with appropriate authorities when it came to investigations and hearings. Uh, effectively, you know, putting it in common parlance and having watched too much TV, they didn't want to be seen as a grass. And um, officers were not really properly engaging or were writing very bland statements, which quite clearly did not incorporate the whole of the story as, 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 that they must have witnessed. So now it's, now it's a positive duty that they, that they actively engage. How one enforces that is another question. But for the minute, that's, that's, what, the, that's what the text says. The flip side of this is that um, there are now additional uh, protections for officers who raise grievances, for officers who assist in the investigation and um, uh, hearings in respect of improper conduct. And there are dedicated chapters in the Home Office guidance now on whistleblowing and grievances, see chapters three and six respectively, which, which uh, are worth reading. They deal with um, um, some of the minutiae of this, particularly around protection for whistleblowers um, under the uh, Employment Rights Act. <clears throat> and um, that's actually one of the keys here. The Home Office guidance specifically says that if an officer makes a, a disclosure that he or she honestly and reasonably believes to be true, uh, uh, and that uh, they utilize the correct procedures, then um, reporting any breach of the standards of professional behavior or any wider failing by the force to meet its legal obligations to the public is a public interest disclosure and garners them protection under the Employment Rights Act. So that, that is a very broad, wide protection afforded to officers now, uh, and one which um, hopefully will provide them with protection to ensure that they engage fully and earnestly with investigations. Um, this is particularly important because of the increasing emergence of office banter cases or WhatsApp cases or social media cases generally, where officers are sharing social media content, which if they took a step back and perhaps put down a bottle of beer, they might realize is a really bad idea. Um, there's a case out of Scotland, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of, the case of C and the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Scotland from 2019, which basically says, that police constables don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy when it comes to social media content shared, shared between them on, on, in that case, a WhatsApp chain. So they now have under this, these changes to the regime, new duties and also new protections to reflect the fact that they really do need to be open around this kind of interaction within the workplace. Um, the final thing I'm just gonna to touch upon uh, today is um, the, the the change in tenor of the regulations to try and get them to be increasingly structured. So subject to the usual provisions that have always existed, that complex matters or those tied to criminal investigations will take longer, there is now an expectation of a six to 12 month turnaround for investigations. Um, that is only to be welcomed. We've all dealt with cases where we get papers or we see, see, see the investigation report and it starts with, in 2014, this officer, and we all sort of shake our heads and sigh a little bit because we know what's coming down the pipeline. It's an abuse application as soon as we get before the chair and it's got a pretty good chance of success. Um, it reflects what Simon said at the beginning, which is these are supposed to be quick and efficient and simple. They're not supposed to be sort of jaundice and jaundice Dickens-like cases that last for, is it John Dyson, I'll be corrected, I'm sure, in a minute, uh, last for, for 80 years. These are supposed to be dealt with efficiently, partly because you've got um, a victim, potentially, in some cases, and you've certainly got an officer just left hanging, dependent on the outcomes of the investigation and the hearing. Uh, and that's someone's livelihood and someone's future. Um, if the investigation is taking longer than that, there is an obligation on the investigator to explain why it's taking more than 12 months, and the guidance sets clear that good reasons will be expected and large gaps in the timeline will need to be explained. I would anticipate that if an investigation does take significantly longer than 12 months uh, and the explanations are not particularly good, you will see a rise in abuse applications from officers uh, representatives. Um, there's other timelines as well. So after the papers are served on the officer, the hearing should commence in 100 days, absent exceptional circumstances. 
they have 15 working days for a response and then the, the chair should receive the papers 30 days uh, before the hearings before the hearing. Um, there is now also an explicit provision uh, that entitles chairs to hold preliminary hearings for misconduct hearings, uh, likely for complex cases. And I think that reflects what's been happening anyway, which is there's been a sort of a burgeoning um, uh, industry in preliminary issues raised around privacy, raised around disclosure, raised around all kinds of matters um, that can come before a panel. Uh, and these are often dealt with at the minute in, on paper, and uh, for the most complex cases, um, it's likely now that there'll be a short hearing uh, if there needs to be legal submissions, sometimes by telephone, it will, will be perfectly appropriate. I think this reflects the trust that are placed in uh, professional chairs to conduct hearings uh, fairly uh, and properly. Um, Simon at the beginning spoke about how um, these are not uh, legal proceedings, but the, the placement of a chair, uh, as opposed to as it previously was a senior officer, um, does reflect to a degree that they are, are more independent than they certainly were before and they are, are more capable of being independent and that's reflected uh, in a case uh, uh, litigated by our very own Fiona Barton QC which came out I think about a month ago the case of the Crown and Short uh, and the Police Misconduct Tribunal I think from February or January this year uh, and what it says is uh, as I've just said there is an expectation of professionalism uh, for chairs and panel members uh, and a small amount of prejudicial material wasn't going to affect their ability to uh, hold a hearing uh, fairly. So whilst I agree, these are still simple and efficient procedures, I think these changes do reflect a, a slight increase in the powers given to the chair and the recognition that the chair, for, for hearings at least, um, is capable of um, conducting matters at a distance from the force where they are sitting. And um, those are the four topics I wanted to uh, cover today. Thank you very much for staying awake and for bearing with me, assuming that you have. Uh, and I'll pass back to Simon now to wrap up and if there are any questions that have come in. Simon. Bobby, thank you very much indeed. Um, one of the banes of uh, the police misconduct procedures have always been um, documents and disclosure. So I'm very pleased to have had one question uh, which relates to that topic. And the question is this. Instead of any other relevant documents gathered during the course of the investigation, that was the phraseology in the old rules, we now have to give an officer any other document which might reasonably be considered capable of undermining or assisting the case. Is this a significant change? Well, the answer is no, not really. And to understand why, you need to look very carefully at paragraphs 9.19 to 9.26 of the Home Office Guidance. And this is really a bit of a recap of what Bobby said at the very beginning. First of all, relevant always did mean capable of undermining or assisting the case. That was in the old guidance. The new guidance makes it very clear, and this is paragraph 9.19, that now that there is an explicit reference to the CPI test in the regulations, this does not import the criminal rules of evidence into the police misconduct regime. The guidance says this, the rules of evidence for police misconduct proceedings are found in the conduct regulations. So you don't need to go outside. Now what happens with documentation? Well, as was always the case, the investigating officer should attach any relevant documents to the investigating officer's report. And you'll remember that an officer is always given the IO's report and the documents attached to it with the notice, that used to be the Reg 21 notice, it's now cheerfully a Reg 30 notice. The officer gets those documents with the notice of the referral to the meeting or the hearing. What is new is that the IO is now just expected to provide a schedule of other documents which were retained by the investigation. If you like, a sort of uh, a news list. The AA then decides if any documents on the schedule should be given to the officer, and they do that by applying the can they reasonably be considered capable of undermining or assisting the case test. 
An officer concerned is able to request further documents from the schedule, but he or she has to show there is a good reason to think that despite the AA's assessment, those documents could be capable of passing the test, could be reasonably considered capable of undermining or assisting the case. The guidance makes it very clear, and this is important, that the AA must not, in inverted commas, simply accede to requests for material from the officer, because every request has to satisfy that test. The guidance at paragraph 9.24 makes it even clearer. Blanket disclosure is wrong. It's not how you should do it. If an officer wants to go a bit further and ask about things that aren't on the schedule, the AA can instruct the investigating officer to make inquiries to recover such material, but only if the AA considers that request to be reasonable and proportionate, two very important words. Importantly, there is no independent obligation on the appropriate authority to search the records of his or her own police force, or indeed the police national computer, for things like witnesses' criminal records, or to give documents from those sources to the officer. Please make sure that LQCs are reminded of all of this in detail. Take them to paragraphs 9.19 to 9.26. If you find they're being asked to exercise their new powers in relation to disclosure at a misconduct pre-hearing. Uh, that, for those who love the detail, is new regulation 33.8e. LQCs must not be allowed to slip into a comfort zone of simply telling the AA what they do in their normal criminal or civil practice, or even worse, trying to follow the principles in the criminal procedure rules or the civil procedure rules. Because as I said at the beginning, the uh, test for evidence or the test for documentation is in the conduct regulations. So it looks frightening, but actually, if your IO has done their job properly, it shouldn't be making a great deal of difference. So uh, I hope that helps. Um, now, I don't know if Georgina is able to tell me whether we have any other questions. Let's have a quick look. <clears throat> yeah, if you have a look in the chat function, we have had a question. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to answer this, um, uh, Bobby, but it's, um, given your view that the new regulations do not greatly change the role of the chair, is regulation 29 meaningless? Well, this, this is a question from a, a very eminent lawyer, Mr. John Bassett. Um, let me read out what 29.1 says. It says, the chair of the panel appointed under regulation 28 must take appropriate action to ensure the efficient and effective bringing of the proceedings and that they are conducted in a timely, fair and transparent manner. And that's given some context by sub regulation two, paragraph two, which says, in particular, and subject to paragraph 6a, the chair must ensure that the first day of the misconduct hearing is not more than 100 working days, beginning with the day after the date on which the notice is given under regulation 31. So uh, what I think regulation 29.1 does is it puts, uh, it gives a general obligation on chairs um, within the context of the more specific obligations around timing to try and ensure that hearings, hearings are brought to bear efficiently uh, and quickly. I don't think it changes the powers of the chair in particular. They always had a general power to conduct the hearing in a way that they saw fit, essentially. Um, but I think it puts, uh, it puts on a more clear footing the need to really um, uh, ensure that parties don't lag in terms of bringing uh, a, a case before the panel. I'm not sure it changes anything in terms of things like the test for abuse or anything like that, which is still to be found in, in the authorities, Redgrave uh, and the like. So I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, yes, I do. Um, one thing that um, a lot of LQCs thought under the 2012 regulations was that they had a lot of power to intervene in the process prior to the beginning of a hearing. That, in fact, in my view, wasn't right, because uh, what Regulation 33 says is that they uh, can control the hearing, but it said nothing about preliminary matters, save for the two 
things that were introduced recently, which is um, the publication of a notice about the hearing, uh, and also something that's always been there, the choice of witnesses. What Regulation 29.1 does, in my view, is make it much clearer that there is an obligation on the chair to take control of the pre-hearing process. And that's to do with setting dates, with setting timetables, with keeping people up to speed. So it's giving them the power that in fact they didn't have before, but of course very many of them exercise quite properly and quite helpfully. That's what I think it means anyway. Um, and I think that is the only other question that we had. So can I now hand over to Georgina to do um, the final wrapping up, please? Thank you. Yes, so um, thank you everyone for joining us today um, on the sofa. Hope you've all finished your cups of tea and it was a nice break from your work. Um, as Simon said at the beginning, this will be available, available to view on our YouTube channel, uh, which is, so if you just search Five Essex Court on YouTube um, and you'll be able to watch it again if you loved it that much. Um, but yeah, thank you very much to Simon and Bobby and hope everyone has a lovely day. Thank you very much and goodbye.